remiss if I did not say publicly a word of thanks and appreciation for those who so willingly filled in while I was gone, both in this pulpit and then teaching the class, and putting out the bulletin. I appreciate that so very much. You enabled me the opportunity to be away and preach the gospel as we did the last couple of weeks, one in Somerset, Kentucky, and the other in Lexington. And, uh, I just am so glad to be back, even though I may be, just be stopping in for a short time. The passage in 1 Samuel chapter 8 indicates to us in verse 5 that after a series of judges took care of judging Israel and looking out for them and guiding them in the course of their existence, they became dissatisfied with that and they decided that they wanted to have a king to rule over them. As a matter of fact, they said to Samuel, the last of the judges and a prophet, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Now Samuel was opposed to that. It, it, it distressed him greatly because, well, one, one reason is he thought they were rejecting him. He thought this was a, a, a slam against him. And in, in a you know, slight way, you could say perhaps he's right about that, but not in the total picture. Because God said, it's not about you, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. He said, rather, they are rejecting me in verse 9. Uh, and, and that's what they wanted. They wanted a king to really replace God. And that's not what they were thinking, but nevertheless, that's what it amounted uh, to, to be. And so what God did is he, he decided that he was going to give them what they asked for. And so Samuel was told to go in 1 Samuel chapter 9 to uh, a Benjamite. And here's what the Bible says. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacharath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And so Samuel goes to the house of, uh, uh, to the tribe of Benjamin, to the house of Gish, and, and he selects a man. And, and uh, what we see then is Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? And so here we find Israel now having a king. This was the first of the kings that would rule over Israel. Now, Saul proved to be a tremendous disappointment to God. And not only was it a disappointment to God, it was a disappointment to the people. You, you know, it didn't take long after Saul began to reign over in 1 Samuel chapter 13 that Saul did something that, was, uh, that, that he had no right, no authority to do. He decided that he was going to offer a burnt offering. That was something only the priest could do. But nevertheless, here was Saul. He was going to do that, and, and God was very displeased with his decision to do that. But actually, the beginning of the end of Saul's reign was found right here in the passage that Luke read uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 15. This was the beginning of the end of his reign. Now look in, in chapter 15, 1 Samuel 15, beginning in verse 2. Here's what the Lord says that he intends for Saul and Saul's army to do. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came, from, uh, came up from Egypt. And now go attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both, male and both man and woman infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, and, do and, and camel and donkey. And so the command was very easy to understand. Here's what I want you to do. Here are the Am uh, uh, here's uh, uh, Agag and the Amaleks. I want you to go up there and destroy them. I want you to take from the king right down to the peasant in the field, and I want you to utterly kill every one of them. Man, woman, boy, girl, oxen, donkey, doesn't make any difference. I don't want you to spare a thing. I want you to destroy every bit of that. And so the command was easy for Saul to understand. 
Now, after his military campaign, after he goes up with his army and fights against Agag and the uh, Amalekites, why, he comes back triumphantly and he builds a monument to himself and he's just patting himself on the back tremendously and he tells uh, Saul or, or tells Samuel rather I have obeyed the Lord verse 13 then Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him blessed are you of the Lord I have performed the commandment of God now I want you to think about that here it is old Samuel comes out to meet this reigning king this, this triumphant king and he says, hey, you know, I, built this, I built this monument. I built this monument to myself and to God. And I want you to know I've just, I, I've obeyed every word that God said for me to perform. And old Samuel, he, he, he might not have been able to see as well as he did in years gone by. But obviously there wasn't anything wrong with his hearing. Because he said to Saul, now if that's the case, Saul, if you've done exactly what God told you to do, then what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ear? I hear these sheep over here. Bad. Well, if you've done everything that God, where do sheep come from? And not only that, he said, what about the lowing of the oxen? I, I hear these oxen over here making a noise. Now, where did them oxen come from? If you've ought to destroy everything that God told you to destroy, how come I'm hearing these sheep? And, and if you've done everything that God told you to, how, how come I'm hearing these oxen? Hey, see, this is not computing. This is not calculating. What does this mean? What does this mean? You said you've done that. What does this mean? I'm going to tell you what this means. And we're going to look at several things that this means. This means in the first place, it didn't make a difference what Saul said. He disobeyed God. And, and you can cut it, slice it, dice it any way that you want to. God told him in verse 3, I want you to utterly destroy. Now you look at verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag. God said, kill him. They spared. And the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatling, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling. You hear him now? He said they were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised, everything worthless, they utterly destroyed. God said, this do, and they said, we're not going to do it. God said utterly destroy, but they were unwilling to utterly destroy. Now this was a serious matter because if you look at verse 26, it cost Saul his kingdom. God said, okay, here's the bottom line. You didn't do what I told you to do. I'm going to take the kingdom from you. And God did. And we know that God then eventually gave it to David, the son of Jesse. But God, it, it, you know, this, this, this shows to us. It shows to us the, the absolute importance of obeying God. Now, I know we're living in a day and age where people kind of, you know, kind of rebuke at that just a little bit. They kind of, you know, minimize the need to obey God. I, I hear it all the time. I see it all the time among people who claim to have a love for God. And yet, they, here's what they say. Here's what often happens. People say, well, now, J.R., we've got to understand something. We're not living under the old covenant. We don't live under the commands of Moses. We don't live under the covenant that was written on tablets of stone. We live under a covenant of grace. And to that I say, amen. We do live under a covenant of grace. You know, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, beginning, for you are saved by, faith, or by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But you know what? That doesn't preclude, that doesn't eliminate the need to obey God. Verse 10 of that same chapter says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Don't you see? You know, when somebody says, Obeying God is not all that important. They're wrong. All they need to look at is what happened here in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Somebody said, well, J.R., you people who advocate the need to obey God and do everything according to the name of Jesus and do all of these things that you say that God demands of you, what do you think? Does that make God more God? 
The more we obey, does that somehow extol God and make Him more God? No, it does not. Any more than disobeying God makes Him any less God. But when we obey God, it says several things about us. It says in the first place that we love God. It is an expression of love. This is the love of God, First uh, John chapter 5 and verse 3. This is the love of God that you keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Anyone who loves God does not find any command of God to be a burden to be born. It is a blessing to share in. Furthermore, obedience not only is an expression of love, it is an expression of servanthood. In Luke chapter 17 in verse 10, Jesus said, after you've done everything that God tells you to do, don't stand around, pat yourself on the back, hold yourself up as an icon. Just simply have the attitude, I have done what was my duty to do because I am a servant of God. It is an expression of sonship. That's it. You know, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells the parable of two sons. And He says that the father told these two sons, go work in the vineyard. And one son said, I will go. But he did And the other son says, I will not go. But he regretted it and he went. And then Jesus asked the question, which one obeyed his father? Which one is a son to his father? And you know, that there's no other question more important than that. And, and, and when we obey God, it says to God, it says to others, I am a child of God. Disobedience to God is a frontal assault on the sovereignty of God. Jesus asked in Luke 6 and verse 46, why? Why do you call me Lord and not do the things that I said? You know, why do you do it? That's kind of like Samuel was saying to, to Saul. Wait a minute. If you did what God said, why am I hearing these sheep and why am I hearing these oxen? And Jesus said, if you call me Lord, why aren't you doing what I tell you to do? You know, again, there's a disconnect here. Now, even though we're saved by grace, and that is God's amazing grace, that does not preclude obedience. You know, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. The Hebrew writer declares in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, nobody, no one has the right to make up his own rules when it comes to serving God. Remember what Paul said to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses 10 and 11? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Somebody said, well, there you are. There you have it. We're saved by grace. Yes, we are. But that's not all that's said in that passage. The grace of God that brings salvation has indeed appeared to all men, teaching us that denying, there's things that we ought to stop doing, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should, now here's some things that we have to do, we should live righteously and soberly and godly. You see that? Yes, that we're saved by grace. That's, that's, that's affirmed in the Scriptures. But you cannot determine from that that there's nothing for us to observe. There's nothing for us to obey. You remember this, this passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is one that we, we're extremely familiar with when Paul talks about that you know, no ungodliness is going to be able to be in heaven. He said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You know, there, there was a time, and it wasn't too long ago, that you could go into any building, housing members of the Church of Christ. And there would be unanimity among the people. And you would ask them, what is adultery? And everybody would know what adultery is. You ask them, what is fornication? And everybody would know what fornication is. You ask them about homosexuality. You ask them about lust. You ask them about all kinds of, uh, of wickedness and they could give you a definitive answer. But you know today, it's not that way. 
Today, you're hearing people equivocate when it comes to adultery. Well, I know what the Bible says, but... You know, it's like a young preacher told me. He said there was a, there was a couple in the congregation where he was worshiping a number of years ago, and they had a son who decided that he no longer loved his wife, he no longer wanted to be married to her because of all of these issues that he began to categorize here. But none of the problems he listed including sexual, it included sexual immorality. Uh, he didn't, no adultery was involved. He just didn't love her anymore. And because of all of these issues that he felt that she brought into this marriage, all this baggage that she, he felt that she had, he's now going to put her out. And so he did. And then suddenly, he finds Miss Perfect and marries her. And so now this couple, whose son I just described, who worshiped with this young preacher, was talking to him about their son's marriage. And here, are, here is what that couple said to the preacher. We have no problem with our son's marriage. Oh, really? We have no problem with our son. Let me see now. I, I can remember. I can remember. Oh yeah, Matthew 19 and verse 9. If a man divorces his wife except, or if, except for fornication and marries another, he commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is put away commits adultery. And the young preacher pointed that out to this couple. And do you know what this couple, members of the church, for years said about that passage in Matthew 19 and verse 9, they said to the preacher, those are just idle words. Now that's where we, that's, that's how low we can stoop when it comes to rejecting the sovereignty of God. We then begin to look at the words of God as just simply being idle words. We must obey God. Bob, if somebody said, I'm not worried about the letter of the law, I'm worried about the spirit of the law. You can't obey the spirit of the law without obeying the letter of the law. Samuel said, wait a minute. What, what about those sheep I hear? And what about those oxen? What does that mean? Well, that means that God was disobeyed. But it means also something else. It means that Saul have lost all evidence of humility. It was gone. It was gone. Wasn't any there at all. Look again in 1 Samuel chapter 15. We find in verse 17 this being said to Saul by Samuel. When you were little in your own eyes, hey, when you weren't so puffed up, when you didn't have everybody bloviating about what a great person you were, and you were now you're building monuments to yourself, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Drop down to verse 23. And you find God saying to Saul through Samuel, for rebellion, and that's exactly what he was involved in, is as the sin of witchcraft. That stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He also has rejected you from being king. Do you, you realize, and I'm certain that many of us do, that pride and arrogance is the reason for rebellion? And, and, and it was that way with Him. Pride and arrogance is often the reason for rebellion. This is why Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. The arrogant, the proud say this. The proud say what Pharaoh said in Exodus 5 and verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? Who does God think He is? Who does God think He is telling me that I have to do this or that or the other? I'm not going to do it. 
I've never been one that would like to be told what to do. This is a reason, you know, I have trouble at work. It's the reason I have trouble with prayer. I don't like being told what to do. And when it comes to God, I don't want God telling me what to do. That's arrogance and that's pride. Saul began to reign well. But it wasn't long that pride began to set in. He got full of himself. And I'm just not going to do it. I, I'm just not going to do it. It may be, God may have said that, I'm just not going to do it. But you know, it's like that like illustration we were given a moment ago. Maybe he felt like God's words were just idle words. He's just idle words. He's words. You know, but when it comes to the Word of God, Psalm 138 and verse 2, God has magnified His Word above His name. And the arrogant will, will ignore and will ridicule and reject what God has to say. Don't, hey, 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 don't you, don't you read this in your Bible? Don't, don't you read what God said to do? That's just idle words. Well, wait, don't, don't, don't you read what God tells you not to do? That's just idle words. What, don't you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. No, you don't. What, don't you, don't you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I believe. No, you don't. You know how I know? James 2 and verse 20, faith without works is dead. If you don't do what God says, you don't even believe what you think you believe. You certainly don't believe what you claim to believe. Now, when we begin with arrogance, the arrogance that Saul had, it won't be long before we mistrust and we mistreat those who are obedient to God. I want you to just dwell on that just a bit. Do you realize that? Do you realize that if, if, if I have a, a haughty spirit and I rebel against what God says, it won't be long before I hate everybody who's doing what God says. It won't be long before I mistrust everybody that's doing what God says. It won't be long before I try to injure those who are not who are doing what God says because I'm not doing it. Somebody said, Jr., that's a pretty bold statement to make. Well, you just follow through what Saul. You remember when people began to praise David over the slaughter of Goliath, and and old Saul got jealous of this, and he tried to he tried to kill David, and David was just a humble servant of God, but he was so furious against David because David was being honored by the people for his faith in God. And rather than praising David, Saul set out to kill him. It's, you know, sometimes when you see problems erupting between people who ought to be <coughs> brethren in the Lord, you, I tell you what, if you look deep enough and you investigate serious enough, then your chances are going to see somebody here not balancing when it comes to the Word of God. They're disobeying and rebelling against God. That's why they have a problem with these folks. That's why, that's why David was mistreated by Saul. David was just simply a humble servant of God. Saul was furious. He was jealous. What does this mean? I hear these sheep. What does it mean? I, I, I hear these oxen over here. Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that God was disobeyed. It means that Saul no longer had any ounce of humility about him. It was gone. He rebelled against God. And it also meant that he feared people more than God. You know, I want you to notice now. Samuel was confronting him about that. But now if you obey, then, then why is Agag still alive? Why are these others still living? Why are these oxen and these sheep still alive? Why, why haven't they been killed? <coughs> well, you know, Saul, he, he, he begins to reason this way. Saul said to Samuel in verse 24, I, I well, yeah, I, I, I'm going to fess up here. I, I sinned. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, and here's why. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now I'm going to tell you something. If you want a good passage that shows to you the power of peer pressure, this is it. But I want you to think about this. Saul was, Saul was king. And here's a king blaming his subjects for what he did. You know, so I, I, let's just stop and put ourselves, let's project ourselves back there for a moment. 
And we're part of the Hebrew people. And we look at our king. Here is King Saul, big guy. Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, he looked like a leader. He was big. He was head. In other words, nobody came any higher to him than his shoulders. A big guy. He was the biggest man in Israel. But you know what? He was a coward. He was a coward. And I know that we don't often look at it that way, but you know, I tell people, and I tell young people this, and they need to understand that. You can get out here and you can pump these weights and you can cause your muscles to swell up, and you can be carrying around, uh, you know, a rib cage that looks like a six pack or whatever they call it. You know, you can just look, and you might be the biggest guy on the football team or you might be the biggest guy in the neighborhood, but one of these days, you're going to come up against somebody bigger than you. When Saul came up against Goliath, who was bigger than him, he wasn't going to have any of it. I'm not going to go fight him. Uh-uh. I'm not going to do that. That means he was a coward. And now he's using that as an excuse. He was fearful of the people. I'm afraid of them. You know, the fear of confrontation the fear of being different. The fear of what others think about you is no different than the fear that Saul said that he had. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 28, don't be afraid of what somebody can do to you, those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Oh, don't worry about those folks. You need to be concerned about fearing God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That, that's, that's what we need to be concerned about. Furthermore, we need to recognize that Revelation 21 and verse 8 says that the cowardly the cowardly some translations say the fearful. The cowardly. And you know what that word cowardly means? It translates a Greek word that means timid. The timid shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says if we're cowards, the Bible says if we're afraid. Now, he's not talking here about going out on the street and fighting somebody or, you know, running somebody he's not, uh, off the road. He's not talking about that kind of fear. But he's talking about being fearful of people more than we are fearful of God. And God said if you're timid when it comes to being thought of as different, when you're timid when it comes to being able to speak up against that which is wrong, like some of the things we talked about in Bible class this morning, if, we begin, if we're fearful of doing that, then we can rest assured that we're going to be condemned. Saul lost his kingdom. We'll lose our souls over that. And there are many believers, there are many believers who, well, they cower like Saul, when push comes to shove. You know, as a matter of fact, you can read in, in, in the book of John, in chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. The Bible says that many of the chief priests believed on Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess Him. Because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, how do you think God views people like that? Well, of course, we know Revelation 21 and verse 8. You know, I talked to a woman recently, and you know what she told me? She said, you know, J.R., when I obeyed the gospel, I did it in college. Somebody taught me the truth, and I obeyed the gospel. She said, you know, I was nearly ostracized by my family. I was nearly disowned by my family when they found out that I became a member of the church. You know, there are a lot of people who wouldn't have that kind of courage. There are a lot of people who would love mother and father more than they love God. And they would reject what God said. They're fearful. These are fearful people. We had an interesting visitor last Sunday in the congregation that I was preaching for in Lexington. They're, they have The location of their building is somewhat interesting. And I know the Kellys used to worship there and they know what I'm talking about. The building sits adjacent to the University of Kentucky campus. 
And so as a result of that, sometimes they set up tables out there in their yard and they give out tracts to the students who are walking by and inviting students to the church services. That's a, that's a great thing. Well, last Sunday morning, one of the young ladies who had been handed a tract visited. But you know what she did? She snuck in. She didn't want anybody to see her sneak in. And then when services were over, she snuck out. Because she was a Muslim. Now I hope and pray that that young woman will have the courage of the young lady that I was talking about saying she was disowned by her family. I hope that young Muslim woman will have the courage to confess Christ. Now you may say, well, you know, Jerry, you've got to understand their culture. Yeah, I do. I understand their culture. But I also understand what Jesus said, that the cowardly, the timid, the fearful will have their lake in the fire in, in, in the have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. What does that mean when I hear a sheep and I hear that ox? What, what does that mean? Well, it means that he feared people more than he feared God. It also meant that he tried his very best best that could be offered, I suppose, to improve upon the commandments of God. God said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to utterly destroy. But now, here's what Saul said in blaming the people. In verse 15, he said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Wait a minute. We're just doing this so we can praise God. We're just doing this to honor God. We're, we're not bringing that back here to just enhance ourselves. We want to use that to worship God. And here's what Samuel said in verse 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Well, I know what God says, but we're doing this to glory, to glorify God. I know what God says, but we're doing this to honor God. <clears throat> Can you think of any New Testament application to that? I know that God says we are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and make melody in our heart to the Lord. I know that's what the Bible says. I know the Bible says doesn't authorize instruments of music, but I'm using this piano to glorify God. No. <coughs> no. It didn't work with Saul. It didn't work with Saul at all. Somebody may say, well, you know, it, it's like one fellow did. You know, one fellow said, well, I tell you what, God has given my wife this special ability. And so she's just using that to honor God. No. Obedience is better than than sacrifice. You know, it, it, you take like the passage in Acts 2 and verse 38 when it comes to the plan of salvation, including baptism. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. And somebody comes along and says, well, you know what? I, I, I know what the Bible says, but I really believe that if somebody was sincere and they couldn't get to water, that I believe they're going to be saved. Really? Really? What, what are you basing that on? Well, it just seems to me. That's it right there. It seems to me. And you see, Saul, it seems to me that we could offer this in, sacri in sacrifice to God and He would be pleased with it. And God said, no, I'm not. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And you know, we mentioned Matthew 19 a moment ago. Consider what Jesus said in verses 3 and 4. I, I guess all the way down to verse 6. When he was asked about divorce, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Sorry, Bruce Jenner. You can change your driver's license and your birth certificate. Mm -mm. It won't work. God made them male and female and said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Uh -uh. Do you see that? Marriage, when God joins a couple is between a man and a woman. God made them male and female. Somebody comes along and says, you know what? I have this wonderful gift from God. 
And my gift from God is my sexual awareness and my sexual orientation and I'm homosexual, that's a gift from God. No, it is not. All you're trying to do is improve upon the commands of God. And it doesn't work. It did not work at all with Saul. God condemned him. And, and basically, how, how could it? God's ways are higher than our ways. His ways are past finding out, Isaiah 55 and verse 8. James says that the law of God in James 1 is a perfect law of liberty. How do you improve upon perfection? How do you improve upon that which is of God, which is higher than man's what? You can't. But that's exactly what Saul was trying to do. What else did that suggest when Samuel heard that sheep and that oxen? It showed that he tried to shift the blame to others. Verse 15, again, they have brought them from the Amalekites. They did it, they did it, a king blaming his subjects, but it didn't work. Verse 23, you're rejected from being king. Didn't say what he was doing to the people. Said what he's doing to the king here. Never works. Didn't work for Saul. Didn't work for Adam. Didn't work for Aaron. Didn't work for Pilate. And it won't work for you. Now there may be some many, many reasons why. And there may be some external reasons why we choose not to obey God. It, 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 you know, it, it may be you've got in with the wrong friends. It may mean that you have been taught incorrectly. It may mean that you have a propensity for this sin or that sin because of life choices. There's a lot of externals. It could be you don't like the elders, you don't like the preacher. You know what? That's not going to cut it on Judgment Day. It's not going to have any bearing upon what God says to you on the day that you stand before Him in judgment. Because according to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we'll all be judged according to what we have done. What happened? Well, in the long run, he was rejected. Now you just think about it. You think when you begin to dispute the idea or the need of being compliant with the teaching of God, just remember what occurred here. Romans 15 and verse 4 says the things that were written before were written for our learning. Is this something that we can learn? That if we try to improve upon the commands of God, if we flagrantly disobey God and we lose our humility and we cave into peer pressure, can we learn that we will be rejected? Can we also learn that the great lesson here is that obedience, obedience to God, trumps everything that we can do, including sacrifice. Obedience to God is paramount. This is why when we conclude a sermon like this, we open up an invitation to those who would desire to obey God. We call it obeying the gospel. And you know, that just simply means that I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the great atoning sacrifice that God provided for lost humanity. I believe that. And based upon that belief, I'm going to appropriate His wonderful sacrifice and have my sins washed away by repenting of them, by confessing my faith in Him, and being baptized into Him for the remission of my sins. And when I do that, I will be saved by the grace of God. And then I'm going to commit myself for the long, however time I'm here upon this earth to being compliant with His teaching learning that behold to obey is better than sacrifice. You're subject to the invitation this morning. Why don't you come right now together to stand and ask yourself.